Australia's northeast coast is a stunning marine paradise and one of the world's best aquatic playgrounds. If you love the ocean, you will love Queensland's coast. I am at Australia's Great Barrier Reef, which is the largest reef system in the world. It is over 2,900 kilometres long and has over 2,000 reefs within it. That makes the jewel of this coast bigger than the United Kingdom and the only living structure visible from space. Rightfully, one of the world's seven natural wonders and home to thousands of marine species. I've done more than 3,000 dives in this environment and have made friends with some of Australia's most unusual characters. But even I feel a novice in the most amazing underwater maze in the world. How did this amazing reef system which we have today, housing all my wonderful friends, come to life? 20,000 years ago, the world was starting to emerge from an ice age. The sea level around the Australian coast was then about 120 metres lower than it is today. As the water trapped in the ice age was slowly released, the sea level began to rise again, and at about 6,000 years ago, it approached its present height. As the sea level rose, the lower lying coastal plains became flooded, and the hills became islands. The taller hills became what are known today as continental islands, because they are often extensions of mountain ranges on the mainland. Most of these islands have fringing reefs. Today, this continental shelf which runs beneath Australia's waters is home to the most magnificent reef system in the world. In modern times, pollution, warm temperatures, overfishing and nutrients pouring off the land is threatening this entire Garden of Eden. On this episode of Roar of the Wild, we visit a wreck which has become one of the world's most spectacular artificial reefs dive the Far North Ribbon Reefs and explore the reefs that exist off Australia's continental shelf. But first, how does this magnificent place keep growing? Or rather, how does it reproduce? The Great Barrier Reef System is built from tiny living animals we know as corals. The main structure is built by hard corals with limestone skeletons, known as reef building corals. There are many species of corals, including soft, brain, and staghorn corals. Every year, over one third of the reef's 350 species of corals reproduce sexually during a mass spawning event. I jumped aboard with one of the best underwater cameramen in the world to see if we could film the spawning of the corals. Dave Hannon has already taken the most amazing footage of coral spawning in controlled laboratory conditions. As you'll see, it's a case of second-guessing nature to see this in the wild. Aboard the Foundation One, we headed out to Myrmidon Reef, out from Townsville. It was November, and we had just had a full moon. Six days after a full moon, corals should spawn. We want to make sure that we choose a really good coral spawning site. The best way to do that is make sure you have a diverse range of corals. The only way to do that is to get in the water. I'm going to have a snorkel around the boat and lay to a manta board to really pick the perfect site. Dave was kitted out like Robocop with his amazing high-tech camera gear. I was happy to dive and search like one of the locals. Much variety? Yep. You got, you got your plates, you got your soft corals, you got a little bit of everything. Myrmidon is a pristine reef system about 130 kilometres offshore. It's surrounded by deep water and famous for fish. The ideal environment for coral is shallow, warm water where there is a lot of water movement and plenty of light. Our team would dive both day and night. We would observe the corals to see if we noticed setting or bulging, which indicates a spawning. There are many different types of coral. Some are slow growing, like brain corals, growing only millimetres a year, and live to be hundreds of years old. Others, like staghorn, are fast growing, but fragile. 
Every year, these structures build just a little more. They've reported a few small sightings of coral, but the main spawn hasn't really happened yet. What we're waiting for is the aroma of fresh spawn and also spawn that you can see on the surface and underwater. Spawning usually takes place at night, so we always had someone in the water. Oh, well, these basic planks are... <laughs> Every day we would dive the superb Myrmidon reef with its schools of fish and beautiful coral gardens. One site I called Magic Bommy as it was simply covered with corals and fish. The Crown of Thorns is a notorious coral eater. Despite their fierce reputation, these guys are just successful predators. But they do tend to eat more than their share and can reach plague proportions. One of their few predators, once they form their spiky exterior, is the giant triton shell. Unfortunately, humans have hunted the triton shell almost to extinction. So this sighting is a rare opportunity to see the giant triton at work. Once he reaches the crown and thorn, he uses his toothy radula, a serrated scraping organ, to saw through the crown of thorns armoured skin and then eats it alive. Back on the boat, we compare notes and wait. Rome was not built in a day and neither was a Great Barrier Reef. It's day five after the full moon, but the corals still haven't quite spawned. What we're waiting for is the corals to set. The bundles of eggs and sperm actually come up into the corals and you can see them about an hour and a half before they spawn. But we haven't seen any of that yet. Perhaps tomorrow's a big day. Finally, on the fifth and sixth nights, the incredible happened. Somehow, the coral species know to mass spawn and we were rewarded as the coral came to life to make more life. There's actually spawn in the water. It's coming to one of these under the bottom. All around us, the corals release polyps into the ocean. Bundles of sperm and eggs rise upward to the surface in this synchronised spawn. To see this is a once-in-a-lifetime treat, and it just makes me appreciate our coral reefs even more. By synchronising their spawning, corals have more chance of survival in a hungry world as predators engage in a feeding frenzy. Millions and millions of corals stand united to help build the mightiest reef in the world. Go little corals, go. Float in the current and find your place to settle. It's a big world out there, but even one tiny coral polyp can make a difference. How else do you think they built the most magnificent reef in the world? Coming up next, I will take you on my favourite dive a shipwreck which has become a living paradise. Today we head offshore to some of the best reefs east of Townsville to find more of the colourful and fascinating facets of this staggering place. There are not many days on the reef where as the day goes on it gets better and better and better. Days like this are few and far between. A total glass out. Here is a small sand cave and later we'll go for a snorkel and find some animals and marine life. Dropping in on another neighbourhood, you see familiar friends in new places doing their survival thing. Many may look and just see ocean. I look and see an ecosystem every bit as fascinating as an old growth rainforest and just as fragile. It was time for me to check out some of the surface features, like this lonely and windy sand cave an important stop for many seabirds. These are the masked booby birds. Both the males and females look after the egg. This may look like paradise, but it's actually a tough place to live. These birds have no shelter, so it must get pretty hot during the middle of the day. One of my favourite dives in the world is the Yongala Wreck. For me, it's a marine wonderland. Whenever I can dive this wreck, I will. And I have done over 300 dives at this magical site. It's hard to believe standing here in the middle of a shipping channel, but down there is a 365-foot vessel called the Yongala. 
On 14th of March 1911, the Yongala departed from the port of Brisbane to make its way up the eastern coast of Australia to Townsville. It was her 99th voyage. To the north, a storm was brewing, which blew into a cyclone. 122 people lost their lives to 30 metres of sea in what would be Australia's worst ever maritime disaster. The Yongala is now a marine park and enjoyed by divers from around the world. Here you can see just about everything. For a diver, or in fact anyone even remotely interested in the other inhabitants of our planet, this is like the greatest fun park ever created. An awe-inspiring sight that gets my blood pumping. The water is almost clouded with bait fish. At the other end of the scale, the mighty gropers seem to be in charge here, curiously and quietly menacing at up to 500 kilos. The beautiful rays of all different types make me feel clumsy as they effortlessly glide. The life around this wreck is always teeming, from drifting jellyfish to slow wise turtles looking for sponges and those jellyfish to eat. The variety and range constantly surprises. Delicate garden beds of anemone and darting clownfish, contrasting against the rusting hulk of the Yongala. By now, the ocean had transformed the wreck into one of the most stunning artificial reefs to be found anywhere in the world. And today, it's a national marine park. From what is a solemn graveyard, life bursts forth all around. Species compete for prime real estate in a hungry ocean. Corals cover nearly every part of the exterior, leaving little room for others to settle. Small creatures like nudibranchs and coral crabs hide among the flowing coral branches. Black oysters have encrusted the frame, so as time erodes the steel, they become the living structure. The bow is still clearly recognisable as it towers up from the sandy bottom, a ghostly silhouette. Beneath the bow, schools of snapper take refuge, as well as a variety of cod. Along the hull, sea snakes hunt for prey, but as they are air breathers, they must constantly make for the surface for a breath. As you make your way up the hull, you swim through gardens of corals and sea whips. Here reef fish thrive. The rare barramundi cod, beautiful mary wrasse, large coral trout, all live, thrive and survive here. As dust draws on, feeding time looms, and many fish like these batfish are forced into tight schools. The guardians of the wreck, the giant groper, start to stir. Schools of giant trevally move into feeding mode. The predators have arrived. There are few wrecks anywhere in the world that are so stunning and beautiful as the Yongala. Had Captain Knight not soured into the eye of the storm and tragedy been avoided, then the life we see today would not thrive in this special place. Don't go away. For my next adventure, I follow in the footsteps of Captain Cook, scaling a mountain to see what he saw over 200 years ago. Lizard Island is a high granite island, about seven square kilometres in size, with three small islands nearby. These islands form the Lizard Island Group, and their well-developed fringing reef hugs the 10 metre deep Blue Lagoon. Lizard Island is one of Australia's most exclusive locations. Not only does it have beautiful white sandy beaches and clear water, but it is also the gateway to the ribbon reefs on the Great Barrier Reef. To see the ribbon reefs, I'm going to climb Lizard Island's highest peak, Cook's Look. Many years ago, Captain Cook did this very warp to the point of Cook's Look. From the top, you get a magnificent view of passages through the reef. These are spectacular views, but unfortunately, this is only the beginning. <laughs> Onward and upward, but the climb is always worth it. All I can say is that Captain Cook must have been a fit man. <laughs> We 
it says on this little map in front of me that Cook's Passage is that way 19 kilometres. And it also says that number 10 Ribbon Reef, which is where we want to go in the next couple of days to the famous cod hole, is that way. But unfortunately on a day like today, you see nothing. The afternoon sun was beginning to golden, so it was a quick trip and hop down from the lookout. Lizard Island was known as a sacred place to the Aboriginals. The Dingal people believed that the lizard group of islands were created in the Dreamtime, as a giant stingray with Lizard Island as the body and the other islands in the group making up the tail. Ribbon, also called barrier reefs, only occur in the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef, extending from Cooktown to eastern Torres Strait, a distance of 670 kilometres. They form along the edge of the continental shelf and the reefs grow high and form narrow walls. This almost continuous barrier is only broken by passages between the individual reefs. Some of these channels, however, are deep enough for ships to pass through. For me, it is the perfect diving playground. Between Cairns and Lizard Island are the best examples of ribbon reefs in the world. It boasts coral gardens, spectacular bombies and sheer wall drop-offs. This was also teeming with life, but not the frantic city-like pace of the Yongala. Here there was a chance for a fish to stretch out and a turtle to quietly contemplate his place in all of this beauty. Next, some science and more fun, beauty and wonder. I jumped on the Undersea Explorer, a boat that not only takes diving seriously, but is also a research platform to help monitor the reef. We'll explore the Ribbon Reefs, the Coral Sea, and Osprey Reef 225 kilometres out to sea. As usual, I couldn't wait to get amongst the marine life. The Ribbon Reefs start north of Port Douglas and run all the way up to number 10 Ribbon Reef at Lizard Island. At the southern end, you find many sites that offer coral gardens and are a breeding ground for many marine species. On the Undersea Explorer, they help to research and understand many of these species. One of the most unusual creatures, and one of my favourites, are the cuttlefish. At certain times of the year, if you keep a keen eye out among the coral gardens of the ribbon reefs, you can see these wonderful critters socialising, mating, and even laying their eggs. Cuttlefish are the masters of disguise, so look carefully. They can change both colour and texture almost instantly to blend in with their surroundings. Despite the name, they are not fish, they're mollusks, and fit into the cephalopod class along with the squids, octopuses and the nautilus. There are plenty of sights on the journey up the ribbon reefs, but the most famous of all is the legendary cod hole. It's home to a family of cod who have become famous around the world. Here the water clarity is usually fairly clean and the site boasts stunning coral gardens. The dive site itself is worth the trip, but the highlight really is the beautiful, bold and big potato cod that grow up to three metres and cruise around the site knowing that this is their home and you're just visiting. Our scientific mission on this expedition was a combination of shark research and to find the deep living nautilus that have lived on this planet 500 million years. Here we're scratching back the sandpaper we're tagging with permanent marker and then covering with nail polish. We're measuring the length, the width of the aperture at the eye sockets. To catch a nautilus, you must set the trap deep in the waters off the reef wall and leave it overnight. Hopefully, when you return for it in the morning, these wonderful little critters have found their way in and have a temporary trip to the surface. On the surface, the Nautilus are measured and marked, given their own little identification number. Tagging and releasing the animals at night and ensuring they're kept in cool tanks on board makes for happy Nautilus. North Horn is a dive site where the currents meet and the pelagic action is at its best. Here it's not uncommon to see 25 sharks on one dive. 
and it's a great place to tag and monitor our sharky friends. A key element of the tagging process is the identification of individual animals, consistent monitoring of the population and recording of growth characteristics. Since this project began, 30 individuals have been identified, with 10 sharks easily recognised by external markings. 28 sharks now have microchip tags to assist in studies into the depth movement of sharks. Efforts to have osprey protected are also underway, so with any luck these sharky friends may become protected. It's important that if we are all going to enjoy having such a wonderful variety of marine species, we must really change our ways. Avoid buying fish from companies that do not care for our environment and use destructive practices like per se netting, long lining and cyanide fishing. If fishing yourself, only take fish that you will eat and eat it all. Don't waste it or kill it for the sake of it. So many of our fish stocks are reaching critical numbers. We are all contributing in some way to the demise of species. But the good news is, we can turn bad habits and practices around. Let the government know we want to back companies who understand the environment and work within the capabilities of the environment. Greed may get us great things for a while, but it will take from us far more than we could ever imagine. This reef took millions of years to grow into what it is today, and I love it just the way it is. <laughs>